Hello everyone, and welcome back to World's True Crime. My name is Brad, and with me as always is my beautiful fiancé, Denise. Hello everyone. So, this week, we, before we get started, we want to give out our sticker winner to this week. Yes, and actually, they are a podcast themselves. Yes, they are. And they are called M-Cubed. Murder, Mystery, and Mayhem. Yeah, if you want to find them, those M3. Yep. Yeah, and they correctly guessed... Keith. Keith. In our last episode. Yeah. Of the Moore's Murder. I think it's pretty uh, fitting that they won because now we get to throw in another promo out there. I was actually going to contact them because I wanted to do like a switch of promos. Like a promo swap? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. So, actually, it worked out for them. Yeah. So, right now, we're going to play their promo for you. Hello, you lovely people. I'm Sam. She's Paige. Hey. Hey. What's up? <laughs> and with the power of dumbassery, we are M-Cubed or M3, Murder, Mystery, and Mayhem. With our squirrely, chaotic energy, we love to do research on cases that make you laugh, cry, and of course, make you go full T-Rex. You know, the level of uncomfortable that makes your arms retract and head attempt to be one with your shoulders. And obviously, the only vocalization is, RAAAAH! <laughs> <laughs> Find us on all the major podcast platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join us in our dumbassery every Thursday! Seriously, come join us. I love that. That's I love that awesome. dumbassery. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think uh, that's their claim name. Yeah, so if anybody wants to go check them out, we'll have their links in our description. Mm -hmm. And when she was like talking about T-Rex, you know, your shoulders retracting in, or your arms retracting into your shoulders. I could totally vision that. I believe that they have um, a scale as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like we used to do back when we first started. Yeah. So I guess we're on to the. Yeah, is there anything else we need to talk about? I don't think so. I just went on a road trip with you. Yeah, we did a road trip. That was freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we sat around and listened to podcasts most of the day. Yep. Actually, all day. Yeah, pretty much. And extra time because, of course, the mill broke down. So we had two and a half hours there. Yeah, so. that was doesn't happen too often, <sighs> but it happened. And road construction. Good old road construction. Oh, yeah, the highway of tears. Yeah. But that was fun. I'd do it again. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah. Next time you're going to bring Braden on your trip. Yeah, I think and so. And I hope he gets all the excitement that I got. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Let's yeah I think get that's on. it. Yeah. Before we get going, I think that's uh nobody really cares about what we're doing so no yeah we do have instagram instagram twitter twitter facebook facebook uh you can email us yep and we also have a patreon too that we started a long time ago which we've never really promoted but yeah it's we, there yeah we never really promote it but it is there we don't really care we're gonna put out episodes no matter what yep so, you want to get on to this? Let's do it. Julio Perez Silva? Yeah, we're going to be doing Julio Perez Silva. I so, actually like the name Julio. Yeah. But we're, before we get going into it, we're going to apologize for some of the names. Oh, yes, because there are, hor like, they're, they're hard for me to say. Even so. the places are hard as well. Because mm -hmm. we are in South America. Yeah. And we are from, personally, from Canada. Yeah. And these names are going <laughs> to be a little bit tough for us. Yeah, we're going to Chile. 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 So Julio Perez Silva is a Chilean serial killer who was active between September 1998 to August 2001. He turned into being the most brutal serial killer in Chilean modern history. Known as a psychopath from Alto Hospicio, mm -hmm. his crimes took place in the Tarapaca region, specifically in the city of Aquiwa. Aquigua. Aquigua. And in the town of Alto Hospicio, hence his nickname, the psychopath from Alto Hospicio. Do you just want me to say that so Hospicio? many times? You just it sounds so fancy. You're waiting for me to mess one of those up, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you throw it in there three times for me. Hospicio. Well, now people know. Hospicio. <laughs> Alto Hospicio. I can't even say it. Julio's MO was always the same. Mm -hmm. While working as a taxi driver, he intercepted girls and young women with offers of free rides, then he would take them somewhere remote where he would rape and kill them with blows to the head. In Alto Hospicio. Alto Hospicio. <laughs> Later, Julio would throw 
the bodies in deep abandoned mines. Also garbage dumps. Okay. Yeah. He was convicted of killing 14 women and was sentenced to life imprisonment in February 26, 2004. So now we're going to let you take it away about his uh, background, childhood, and exactly what happened. Right. I'm going to get into the, is yours. the mumbling of their names and places. And I want to sit here and... Critique? Critique. You, this look at my eye rolls. Oh, that was actually pretty good. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. To no, else could see that. Oh. So Julio Perez Silva was born on July 15th, 1963. His nickname as a child was Segua. I think it was Segua. I looked it up to find out what it meant. But every time I looked it up, it kept wanting to spell check me. Okay. So I don't know what it means. So he spent most of his time on the streets of Puchakawi. 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 I even have it written there in a, a language I might understand it. And I still screw it up. <laughs> Those who knew him at school agreed that he was quiet, introverted student, as well as a kind and supportive person who women flocked to. The only time he seemed to be mean was when he played soccer for the Quigua senior team. Probably his competitive nature played a huge part, I'm thinking. Oh, most likely, yeah. You know, soccer is very like prominent down there, too. Mm-hmm. I so, used to be a soccer player. Yeah, so I mean, he would get mean playing because like, there's a lot of passion in soccer. Yeah, I remember because I played indoor soccer and I got slammed into a wall and sliced my knee right open. I rem- oh, really? Yeah. I, re- I remember a story too down there. There was like a uh, a soccer player. He scored on his own net and the cartel killed him. What? Yeah, there was like a soccer match. I, I think it was like the 80s or something like that or I don't know what it was. I just know the story of like, yeah, he scored on his own net, I believe, by probably accident. Probably because they had bets on the oh, whole yeah, thing, right? Sure. So they probably lost money because of this. Yeah, and they ended up killing him. Yeah. Uh, they take soccer very seriously. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I should say football. Football. Well, very serious. We call it soccer. Well, we call it soccer. Yeah, I played for um, the BC Winter Games. I know. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, at the age of 22, he married Monica Systemus, who was native to the cholera. And they ended up having two daughters. Later, he ended up with Marianella Vergaro for five years, who already had two other daughters of her own. I had bullet points there because I wasn't sure if they were her daughters or his daughter that he had with her because there was a conflict when I looked it up. So either she already had two daughters of her own when she met him or he ended up having two daughters with her. Oh, okay. So. Either he's a dad or stepdad. Yeah. Either way, he's a dad. Yeah. With her, he returned to Puchan Kavi and gained the reputation of being a good husband. Then, in the mid-1990s, he relocated to Aguigua to look for better job opportunities. He ended up finding a job loading sacks of salt. Now, I'm not sure about you, Brad, but that seems like a shitty job and probably unpaid for the labor involved. Because remember when you used to have that job um, loading all those bags? Yeah, it was not loading bags. It was unloading bags. Unloading bags. Yeah, and it was... uh, Pretty labor intensive. Very labor like overworked underpaid right so i'm sure like this job was probably one of those kind of opportunities where i don't know if it was a better job opportunity that he found but he had some work there probably wasn't a lot of like you know work down there for for high pay so you gotta approach just take whatever you get yeah but while at a party he met nancy borero 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 yep borero that was about right she was 14 years older than him and a mother of six children. So, yeah, it's another woman with her own children. So, that right now, between his kids and all that stuff, that's like 10 children. <laughs> I know. In 1997, a neighbor, Alicia Moreno, said Julio was a great husband and person. She said, in April, my son got sick with hepatitis and Julio gave him lunch while I was working. And when our TV got damaged... The kid went to watch TV to his house. It's weird that she says the kid. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> I know. Like not my kid not or my, my child kid, the or, kid. or his, his name. Yeah, just the kid. <laughs> she said he was always quiet, although he loved to talk about his three dogs. Not his 10 children, though? No. <laughs> when, no. <laughs> when he made bread, he would even share it with his friends. So it seems right now that he's 
somewhat of a good person, but he, you know, sucks at relationships. And that's the most of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need a sound effect on that one. I know. After only two weeks, they moved in together and then settled into Alto Hospicio in a sector known as La Negra and then moved to Auto Construction, another local sector. He left his job as a loader. I'm thinking that the loader is what they call the salt stacker. is called a loader. because Yeah, he, I would say, yeah, they load. He could because, be loading trucks or he could be loading, yeah. he was loading lots of things. I think that's what they called him was because his job title was a, a loader. Okay. So, so he started an illegal job of being a taxi driver. Ooh, this is where he gets into the... Yeah. Yeah. It was then that he began a string of crimes, all of similar characteristics, and turned into the most evil, sadistic asshole learned that he is. Okay. Women started disappearing from a small mining town 1,100 miles from Santiago, Chile, Alto Hospicio. It's like I'm saying that lots of times, And you too. know what? You said women right there. I gotta say that was right. Julio's M.O. was to choose his victims based on their looks. Kind of like a Ted Bundy and most people like... I was just going to say, wasn't that a Ted Bundy thing? Yeah, but I wasn't... Like, yeah like women with, uh, you know, brunettes with parts down the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it like a common thing that people did that? Uh, some people did that. A lot of people didn't do that. Like some people just like men or just women, but not like a simple like characteristic, like, a, you know, like hair colors and stuff like that okay. it was pretty rare but i mean some people had like you know like just blondes mm-hmm. you know it didn't matter like you know what they look like by parts of the middle but just blonde would, would do okay well he would choose women who were skinny with long brown hair he took his time when he found the bright girl he actually would spend days profiling her and finding out their patterns and just so happened to be around when they might need a ride. Once he was sure about his victim, he would offer to take them home to school or even to work for just a few coins since he was a taxi driver. And also too, being a taxi driver, they gotta be pretty trusting of that person because they're a taxi driver. Right, I would trust a taxi driver. I would too, like I would not even think twice about it. They always have people. Yeah. and. People didn't know that he was illegally doing this. Right. But also, too, you remember watching the Bone Collector movie with the dad Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie? He was a taxi driver as well. So sometimes you can't trust a taxi driver. Yeah. I say in this world now, you can't really trust anyone. So when I say just a few coins, I'm internally translating that to pesos. So one peso is only six and a half cents Canadian. Canadian. Okay. So just a couple pesos. Of course, you're going to take a a ride, right? Because it's cheap. So cheap. Yeah. So once he had them secured in the car, he would threaten them with a knife until they got to the destination, then beat them and rape them afterwards. When he was done having his way with the women or girls, he would bind their hands and feet and beat them until their death and place their bodies in bags and toss them into dumps or abandoned mine shafts. When the women were examined later, they all had damage to the skulls and fractured ribs. So we're going to go into movie time now. Okay. Yep. Hope you don't get it. (laughs) Beetlejuice. 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 It's showtime. Okay, I'm ready to do this. Let's do this thing. So this is actually an easy one. Okay. Again, it's comedy. Okay. It has well-known actors in it, male. Um, One, actually both of them are cops. In the movie? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. A funny comedy, like one travels to another country. Oh, Rush Hour? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Fuck you. 
I can't say like Chris Tucker or Jackie Chan. No, it's easy. <laughs> Actually, the first thing I was thinking about with the cops was he like blue streak from like because that was the nineties as well. That was with like Martin Lawrence and Steve Zahn. I've never seen it, and they both were cops as well. But once he said another country, the next thing that came to my head was Jackie Chan. And we just watched it not long ago, uh, and there's many of yeah. them. Like how many? Three? Yeah, Three, I think. I yeah. think so. We watched. Uh, yeah, it was the original? I think was yeah, it? it was yeah. the original that we just watched, and then the second one was on. But then I think we had stuff to do. Right. So, good job. Thank you. On September 17th, 1998, that's the time period, Julio picked up a girl with his taxi at Aquigua Coastal Montserrat, Montserrat? Montserrat, yeah. Graciela Serra Avia, who was only 17 years old. He offered her money for sex. She agreed, but then instead, she tried to rob him. Him. That's probably not a good idea. No. This pissed off Julio, and he retaliated by hitting her until she was dead, and then dropped her body off at a beach. For a short time, he did not kill again. So that after that first one, he kind of just took a little break, and mm-hmm. maybe I think he, he was got, worried. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe he got scared, because uh, you kill someone, you think that you're going to get caught for it. Well, that's what we do in movie time, right? Because crossing that line to murder mm-hmm. is a huge step in a, a murderer's life. And him not doing it for a while afterwards, he must have been freaking out. But then after like a sense of like, once it starts to calm himself down a little bit, he was probably he like, got away with it. Then- I got away with it. I'm going to try that again and again. Because the high I bet you was good. Mm-hmm. But then afterwards, it was like now fear. and And that's exactly what happens here. Okay. He was quiet, and then all of a sudden, like... Just snapped. Yeah, he just snapped, and i got to give a warning here, because I'm going to be going through a lot of names here. And they're not going to be easy. And they're not like. easy, and he killed a lot of people in a short time. Right. So, in April 1999, he killed 16-year-old Ornella Linares, and then, only four months later, he killed 15-year-old Ivan Carrillo. 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 In August 1999. On November 24th, 1999, eighth grade, 13 year old Macarena Sanchez was walking out of her home in Alto Hospicio to go to school at Liceo Aloterio Ramirez. Julio asked her if she wanted a ride for just a couple coins. And since the buses were never reliable around there, she agreed to go with him because she was afraid that she would end up being late for class. Yeah, because if she took the bus, she'd be late. Right. When I looked it up, it said that the buses around there, like, um, they're sporadic. Sometimes they would show up. Sometimes they wouldn't show up. I remember when I was, like, working at the, a cabinet place years ago, mm-hmm. I was waiting at the bus stop, and the bus didn't show up. I'm like, hmm, why is it? Because every day the bus showed up always. Mm-hmm. And then the next bus showed up, like, it was, like, 45 minutes later. And I'm sitting there, like, outside for, like, 45 minutes. I'm late for work. This was winter time too, wasn't it? Yeah. And I'm sitting there. And finally, the, the next bus shows up. And I'm like, hey, the first bus didn't show up. And he's like, oh, really? Oh, that sucks. Well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, mm. You have a bus schedule for a freaking reason. Yeah, and now I'm late for work. And I, I didn't, yeah, I did have a cell phone. No, I didn't have a cell phone at the time no, either. You it was didn't. before cell phones. Like before everybody had mm-hmm. them like constantly and i was like i didn't know what to do because like do I, I, go showed back to work, home? I showed up to work i showed up to work like yeah the bus was late i'm like it's like it's like in high school and saying the dog <laughs> ate my homework <laughs> oh like my really gosh, yeah. the bus was late or you just sleep in i'm like well the bus really was late I've like se- the buses are never late yeah but i've seen them before where they're detouring down other streets and missing a bunch of bus stops yeah. it's like what the what are you doing? Well, you didn't detour anywhere near where I was. I'm like, this is retarded. Well, I just don't think yeah, you Yeah, where we up. were before, you couldn't detour. You ha- That yeah. was the route. And usually our bus system is like very, very like structured and solid. Mm-hmm. That's why they didn't really believe me. I'm like, really? Yeah. I think sometimes when they're running behind schedule, they, just s- cut. they yeah. cut off uh, certain stops and they'll just get back on schedule again. So I think somehow you got cut. And the funny thing was, I'll take the bus every day. So he knew I was there. Yeah. He's like... Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring him any cookies or donuts no. or something to the bus driver. So well, I, like, I just listen to music in my, my headphones and not even talk to anybody. So, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. He's probably like at home that night. He's like, 
Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he froze. <laughs> Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, that was you, not fun. Yeah, you were complaining. I was pretty mad. Yeah. Because work didn't really, my work didn't really believe me because they uh, thought I just slept in. Wasn't that the time that you ended up having to stay later and I had to go pick you up from work or something? Yeah, I did. Because, I, had to, I, had pick, I had to make up for that time. Yeah. And then the bus was going at that time or something like that. So I had to go pick you up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are we back to... Back to the story. Okay. So after threatening her with a knife and raping her... He tied her hands and threw her into the old silver mine, the Wanajaya Peak, which is more than 220 meters deep. Or seven, yeah, how, how big that, is that? 722 feet. That's freaking huge. Mm-hmm. There's huge. A, <laughs> there's a lot of mine shafts around there that are abandoned. Yeah. So this must have lit a fire under Julio's ass since. He must have had such a thrill from killing Macarena that his killings actually intensified even more. Just a few months later, in February 2000, Julio murdered three people in the desert. First, 36-year-old Chisela Megarejo. Then, on February 21, 2000, 18-year-old Sarah Gomez. And then, just three days later, on the 24th, the 24-year-old cell phone promoter Angelica Lay. On March 23rd, 2000, the same year, exactly one month after killing Angelica, he assaulted and murdered 14-year-old Laura Zola. Just like Macarena, she was raped and murdered in Wanajoya. Then, on April 5th, 2000, he attacked 16-year-old Catherine Arce Rivera, whom he raped and murdered like Angelica Lay then buried her in an unofficial garbage dump. So he's like ramping it up here. Like it mm. seems like every few days he's like doing another big murder. Yep. That's why I gave that warning because it's just one after another after yeah, another. Yeah, this is a short period of time. Like it's like March, April, like it's uh, every month. It's like, mm-hmm. it seems like he's killed one, two, three people. And I feel bad because I can't go on about these people. It's just, it's just too many one after another. So and I'm not even close to being done yet. On May 22, 2000, he killed 17-year-old Patricia Palma, who was on her way home just having left Ly- Lyceum Theater. Ly- yeah, Lyceum Theater sounds good. It was at that moment that Julio kidnapped, raped, and killed her, leaving her body in the mine along with the corpses of Macarena and Laura. So he's putting them together in the mine. Yep. He had his dumping ground. Okay. Um, it was either at the dump, the actual dump. Yeah, yeah. Or the mine shaft. So then, 11 days later, on June 2nd, 2000, he killed 15-year-old Macarena Montesino in the Pampa El Mole sector. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. These are, this is another disclaimer. These are really hard. It is. And I'm trying to do my best and, you know, people might get mad, but whatever. Yeah, we had a few YouTube comments saying that our... Names were a little bit... Uh, well, what do you expect? We're, you know, we're in Canada. We give disclaimers. We're not going to be perfect saying these names and countries. No, they're places. Really, like, these are really tough because we're going into a different realm here. So mm-hmm. this isn't our typical just like down the road from us. These yeah. are, this is a, you know, ha- you know, down the world from us. This is in Central America. So we we're, ha- trying we're, to we're, bring- we're trying to bring it to light for everybody. Yeah. So I just let the... The haters hate. Well, I don't care. She too suffered the same fate as Angelica and Catherine and was dumped at a garbage dump. It's so freaking sad that you just, you're dumping these bodies at garbage dumps, you know? That like they're, is like they're the trashed. worst. That's the worst. Yep. 18 days later, on June 20th, 16 year old Vivian Garay Mo had the same fate with a blow to her head. This is where things changed. The father of Vivian Garay, Orlando, got things going. He began to fight for the truth and did not accept the authorities' speculations. He sold his fisherman's boat to gather the families of other disappeared girls to find answers. So he wasn't just sitting on his ass and let, like, like taking it. He was nope. trying to figure out what's going on here. Yep. This is how family members and friends and neighbors looked for the young women. Unfortunately, the authorities were no help. That's a lot of cases too. Like authorities, sometimes they just like, man, just chalk it up as a runaway mm-hmm. or 
or whatever, right? Oh, they had their, I'll go get, get into their reasons, but these parents are the ones that started searching, like looking for the- And as they should. Yep. Yep. I would. Oh, I would too, in a heartbeat. Like I would be every day looking for my child, looking for all the children. Yeah, 100%. So the authorities had their own views of what happened to the girls. One idea was that the girls ran away from abusive homes due to poverty. Fortunately, that was pushed aside since the parents denied that there was any violence in the home. The second idea that they had was that perhaps the daughters were taken to, as white slaves in Peru or Bolivia. The possibility of prostitution where young women were being abducted and placed in brothels in the area. That's what they always seems to go to. When a lot of like women mm-hmm. go missing in a certain area. They're like, sex trafficking, sex trafficking. Yeah. Yep. And again, they were wrong. Okay. Oh, we're going to get into the secret word before I forget. Okay. It's going to be taco. Okay. <laughs> Not because we're in Chile, but because um, you know how we've been trying to eat healthy yep. and having no gluten, no um, pasta. Or unwanted sugars and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. We've been just trying to, you know, no flavor, no life. <laughs> yeah. I started talking to another podcaster because they were like recommending things and how we could eat healthier. And then we both started craving tacos. So, yeah. Taco. Taco. Send taco to our uh, socials, our messages, yeah. whatever. And Please send tacos. Yeah. We'll send out a, a sticker and a, give a shout out. Yeah. Do our do our thing. Or literally just send us a taco. <laughs> <laughs> I could eat a taco. Okay. So, finally, the case was solicited to President Ricardo Lagos, who sped up the process of investigation. He served from 2000 to 2006 and helped abolish the death penalty in 2001. I'm sure that he had major regrets after this case. Well, I don't know. If he doesn't believe in it, then it doesn't really matter. I don't know. Some people believe in it. Some people don't. If he got rid of it, that means he believed in, like, he went through the channels to get rid of it, even though... You know, but this is the first huge serial killer. Yeah, but pretty sure he still doesn't believe in it, no matter who the person is. Yeah, yeah. He's I, not uh, George W. Bush in Texas who likes to just kill everybody. W. W. <laughs> Didn't somebody take all the W's from the all the laptops and stuff like that when the office changed? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, okay. So he assigned a special police commission to take on this case and only this case alone, not George W. Bush. But (laughs) Ricardo, although the authorities refused to call a prosecutor to investigate the case due to all of them being convinced it was nothing more than a social problem. Like runaways and stuff like that. Yeah. Like imagine somebody like the the president saying something like that, saying, okay, well, you guys need to do this. And you're like, "Mm, I don't know, because they they wouldn't even get a prosecutor. Yeah. They went against the president. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's this. It's just probably the where the world this is too, right? Maybe I just think that that just blew my mind. So during all this time, the mysterious disappearances of so many young women from Alto Hospicio reached national coverage. Never did they think that there was going to be the possibility of a serial killer on the loose or even kidnapping. Yeah, I don't know too much about like Chilean serial killers, like this one here, and I don't know too many more. I'm sure you're going to find another one for me. I probably will. Someday. (laughs) There's always one out there. Yeah. Oh, there's too many. If you look into the disappearances of all these girls that they knew about at this point, all were young girls who went to the same school and all of them had the same physical features. Oh, wow. They went to the same school? Mm -hmm. All of them? Really? Wow. So I don't understand how they couldn't piece this together. Like, it's just... You kind of at that point, it's like, I think there might be a serial killer. At the same on the loose. time, if you're not looking for one, you're not going to piece it together. Yeah, but I don't know. When you see all these women or children going missing, they'll look exactly the yeah, same. And yeah. And you have that board, you know, and you're putting all these pictures. It's like, wait a minute. Is it like the guy from, uh, uh, what was that TV show? Uh, Charlie Dave. From it's always sunny Philadelphia. We we buy that board with all the red string. He's like freaking <laughs> this, out. Yeah, this is like that's a meme. The meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what so, it, that's what this looks like to me. There's like one guy like in this little office going freaking out, man. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, yeah, yeah, there you go. So I think the authorities, you know, really botched this. Oh, 100%. Yeah. On July 18th, 2000, a bag of clothes belonging to Viviana were found in a rubbish dump where, according to her family and friends, she never went to. The same day, in another landfill, the neighbors found Catherine Arce's backpack and her school uniform. On July 20th, 2000, Ines Valdivia, mother of 17-year-old Patricia Palma, found her daughter's underwear in a ravine. Yeah, because they were looking, right? Like, actively looking. All these parents were out there looking while the police did nothing. So because the events finally became a high-profile case and the news were all over it like flies on shit, the murder stopped for a brief time. Julio did not attack for nine months. But then on April 17, 2001, he struck again in the sector of auto construction where he intercepted a child who was younger than 16 years, Martin Maritza Diaz. So the reason why I say younger than 16 is because they didn't have much information. They were only saying her first name before, but I found in another article her last name. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because she was, they probably would have posted that like young age is like, mm-hmm. younger than the age. Right. So they're not really giving much information about her. Yeah, because I, I do know, I think in Canada, they actually don't post anybody under the name of 18, like either perpetrator mm-hmm. until they're convicted, I believe. Well. Or until like, if they're, if the parents say they can. I'm not sure exactly how that yeah. works out, but they usually don't put uh, underage people in the, uh, the tabloids. Well, I'll get into more about her right now, and then you might have a, a reason for this. Okay. Julio threatened her with a knife and even raped her. But thankfully, he did not manage to kill her. She was lucky enough to escape and returned home. She was taken to the hospital where they were able to get samples of Julio's sperm. See, my reasoning was maybe she lived. That's why they're not giving information. Oh, most likely, yeah, because underage. Drawing attention to her. And her family and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So, unfortunately, before Julio was caught, he managed to kill two more women. 16-year-old Daisy Castro, a month later in May, and then again his oldest victim, 45-year-old Angelica Palape, on August 23, 2001. In September 2001, 21 months after the first person went missing, Carabin Arrows wrote a letter admitting that the case could be from assassination. Yeah, well, what is Carabineros? I have that. Okay. Carabineros are the Chilean National Law Enforcement Police, who has jurisdiction over the entire national territory of the, Re- the Republic of Chile. So they're kind of like uh, like FBI or something, maybe? Yeah. They're like the, the big guns. The, bi- the big police or yeah. something. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. I'm glad I, I, I had never, it. I've actually never heard that before. <laughs> Me either. I had it written down. When I see that, Carabineros? Yeah. I think Carabinas. I don't know. That's what I was <laughs> thinking. Or Carabiner? Yeah, like when I was like for like mountain climbing, like rock climbing and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they wrote a criminal event, it is possible related to a psychopathic modus operandi, which acquires more vigor as the underage girls are yet to be found. And we have not received signs of any of them. It must be considered the participation of one or more persons and that the disappearances may belong to a series of assassinations. So they are thinking that they just all got assassinated. Yeah. So even with the authorities in full force now and the search was on, Julio was not done yet. On October 3rd, 13-year-old Barbara Nunez Barrios was attacked. Julio picked her up from her home in a white cross-country Toyota car to drive her to school. You would think that the parents at this point would have warned the children about, you know, the possibility of a, a serial killer on the loose or... Yeah, and it's also, too, it's pretty easy to pick up, a, like, a 13-year-old girl mm-hmm. to take her to school. That's... I don't know. That's... Well, remember, he's pretending he's a taxi driver. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So he was in a taxi. Mm-hmm. Probably just asked for a few coins, like pesos, well, exactly. right? Exactly. That was his whole thing. He did that all the way through with every one of them. Wow. And I just, I find that really shocking that parents are like not saying go, you know, with anyone. Like walk your child to school. Yeah. I guess you, 
you know, it's hard to say that you can walk them to school because people have jobs. Yeah. And you know what? We live, like, we have to rely on taxis here where we live because we don't have Ubers where we are because we have a smaller city. Yeah, we don't have an Uber. We don't have Ubers. We have buses and taxis. So, I mean, if you're, like, out and you need a taxi, you, you pretty much have no choice. I thought they were bringing Uber here. I don't know. I think we're too small for that. Oh, wah, wah. Yeah. We're so not, any- We're not in the big city. Yeah. So anyways, on the way to school, he threatened her with a knife and changed directions from the school to the outskirts of town. Once he was stopped, he, as per usual, would rape her and started hitting her with a stone until he figured she was dead. Driving to his dumping grounds, he tossed her body down a 50-meter mine shaft, which was about 20 miles from Aquigua. Luckily, she was not dead like he had thought. She laid there for five hours unconscious. A 50 meter drop? Yeah. Like that's what? That's pretty big, isn't it? That's a big hole. Yeah. Wow. So when she finally woke up from her attempted murder, Barbara somehow made her way back home and was brought to the hospital for head injuries and to report her attacker. Good for her. Yeah. 13 year old girl surviving this? Mm hmm. Barbara was able to give a description of her attacker and the vehicle he was driving. The taxi cab. Yep. And so 38-year-old Julio Perez Silva was arrested at the traffic light, but now he had changed his hair color. For some reason, I don't know why. I just thought I'd throw that in there because i seen that. Do you know what he changed it to? Blue. I'm picturing a no. red mohawk. <laughs> why? Because you had one at one point? I did, and I was just picturing a red mohawk for some reason. No. I don't know. I think maybe highlights. Oh, well, t- early 2000s? Possibly. Early yeah. 2000s, yeah. Never know. So he had previous no records, but of course, after his arrest, while some say he was a good person, there were others that heard rumors that he was flashing people, as well as a possibility that he had raped previous people in Puchakavi. So he was just like flashing people yeah i don't understand he was a flasher. i don't understand the flasher i don't understand that like i think people just get i don't know the thrill of the it thrill that oh somebody seen my penis maybe they're got excited from it like really people we do not get excited when we see somebody's penis well no, unless, I, I, mm, i've never understood the flasher i don't know if somebody flashed me i'd probably laugh and point i'd be dead <laughs> it's like i almost see something there oh no can't see nothing behind that bush. Hold on. Let me get my, micro, oh, my yeah. microphone glass. Yep. Oh, I would laugh at them and point. I, I know I would. <laughs> I would probably turn them into a killer by doing that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Oh, I will though. So at first, Julio was unwavering while being interrogated. Maritza Diaz, his first victim that was able to escape the death that we talked about, the one that uh, the under 16 year old was even able to identify him with just his voice from the night that he attacked her, as well as the semen matched the one that was extracted from her. He played a psychological game, which is common with psychopaths, of showing no emotion and being completely cold. At first, he denied all charges, but then the authorities had a plan. I don't know if you remember, I started laughing when I was researching. Uh, he went and looked at me and I was like, yes, I should do. Yep. This is it. So while being held in a cell, the OS7, which is the police drug department, decided to break his resistance. How, you might wonder? Through a technique of sleep systematic interruptions. What they did was wake him every 30 minutes. Yeah, I've heard this tactic before. Oh, have you? I thought oh, yeah. it was so funny. It's like, oh, if this happened to me. I would like spill my beans. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this before because they want them to to talk. Yeah. So yeah, they just keep them awake and awake till they just can't take it anymore. Yeah. So doing this, he would be so stressed from lack of sleep, and in the end, he would start talking. This method does affect judgment, psychomotor skills, memory, decision making, concentration, and attention. So, anyways, he was an easy break since the next day after questioning. He went from being cold to defiant, a little pissed off. Yeah, this is almost like uh, a Guantanamo Bay, like, torture methods of, like, waterboarding and stuff like that. Like, 
keeping people awake like constantly like you think you're about to go to sleep all of a sudden you get woken up like you know when you have a nap you wake up you're like where the hell am i (laughs) you feel like you slept for like 10 hours you're like you know 10 minutes this reminds me of um uh the tv show with um celebrities called the mole okay have you seen that no oh one of them got stuck in a room and they i think it was this show they played tiny bubbles over and over and over again it's a song. Yep. Until they were like going nuts just all night long playing Tiny Bubbles. Oh, yeah. I think also in Guantanamo Bay, too, they did, they played like Enter Sandman, I think, over and over again. That'd be cool. Well, I, I'd actually like that one. I remember when I was a teenager, we used to have, uh, we used to go to the rock quarries, like I mentioned like, yeah. in our previous episodes. And uh, on our way out there, it was like, you know, about a 45 minute drive. And all we had was one cassette tape because we had cassettes back then. And all it had was Sad But True over and over, front to back, A and B side by Metallica. Sad But True. And you know what? After about like two weeks of that, it went into the rock quarry. <laughs> so I can imagine listening to like one song over and over again. It would get, oh, I can't even imagine. Didn't you have like something like that when you went to uh, Saskatchewan with your grandmother? I had a, a tape of different songs though, but I had uh, I had Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, over and over. It was like a. Uh, Let's let everyone know that you are not, you know, seventy years old. Yeah, it was like a twelve-hour drive, <laughs> but we had, but we had different songs. Okay, that's funny. I just found that this technique was really hilarious because I I would totally break. Oh, I would break too. Like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> what do you want to know? I'll tell you it all. Just let me sleep. So, <laughs> yeah, I also uh, me in the morning without coffee, warming up uh, my cold soul. <laughs> Yeah, you you like your coffee. I do like my coffee. It yeah, I'm a cold hearted bitch without my coffee. So, anyways, later that day, he admitted to attacking 13 year old Barbara, but still no confession to her murder. They knew that there was more to this guy, so the police continued with their investigations for a couple more days. So more with this interrupted sleep and yeah interrogations. Yeah. I think that they could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like they knew that this tactic was working. Yeah, it was working because even after the first day, he started to break. Right. Julio confessed to the murders and rapes. He also said he worked alone and denied having dementia. I'm not sure why that was even thrown in there. I don't know. Oh, I thought maybe you had something to put about that. Because like that was one of his things. I do not have dementia. I don't know. Maybe because it's something in his uh, makeup or something. I don't know. Maybe. So he even gave information to where the bodies were. Apparently, the thing that the police remember about Julio the most was his extreme coldness when he recounted what he did to these girls, telling his story with no regard to what he did or what he put them through. Just ice. Yeah, it's like psychopathic, narcissism. Yeah. Just like God complex. It's pretty uh, severe when that's what the police remember about him the most is how cold Cold. he was. Not once was he sorry for what he had done. And when police asked him why he killed the women, he only said he did not know. They now had the bodies of seven victims who had been missing from February 24, 2000. Julio was charged with 14 first degree murders two violations and assassination. After all the court proceedings on February 26, 2004, 40-year-old Julio was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the murders of 11 adolescents and three adults and the attempted murder of the two other ones that got away. Right. Life imprisonment in Chile is 40 uninterrupted years with no benefits. This is the maximum they are able to give. He at first was sent to Arica Penitentiary Complex before being transferred to Colina 1 in Santiago and is monitored 24 hours a day with cameras due to his attempted suicide on January 19, 2005. How did he, do you know how he tried to uh, I do. suicide? Yeah. Okay. He actually tried to strangle himself using a shoelace wrapped around his neck and a toothbrush to tighten up the string. Like a garrotte type deal. Yeah. Just turn, yeah. Keep turning That's it. That's exactly what uh, 
That's how John Wayne Gacy used to kill the boys that he, when he took to his home. He put a wire around his neck with like a stick and he like turned that really? stick. Oh yeah. He got behind them because like it was for like sex and stuff. He get behind them and just wrap the uh, rope around them and then tie it like at the, the stick and it'll just turn it and turn it and turn it until they went out. Well, I don't understand why because he could just like strangle them like just. I think he, that's that's just the way he liked to do it, and also too he's dealing with boys too, like young boys who are strong too. So this probably gave him extra leverage and stuff to get you know done fast, and for them not to fight back as much. Oh, that's sick! I don't think I can actually listen to that story. I wanted to, but oh, it's yeah, just it's a, a tough one. It's children that really it breaks my heart. I'm having a hard time, and I'm trying to get over that, but it's oh. A hard pill to swallow that one. So, anyways, a guard found him and sent him to the hospital for cerebral hypoxia. Julio Perez is still clinging to the hopes of being released, despite the fact that he still has 30 more years to serve behind bars. Along with this, it is revealed that in a conversation, Julio acknowledged that no one from his family visited him. However, he has a person who is looking out for him, a woman who visits him periodically, a woman from his past. So one of his like three wives or girlfriends that he had? Nope. No? The woman said, I love him very much. I fell in love with him. He tells me that I cannot forget him, that he loves me very much, and that I shouldn't leave him alone, that he never leaves him alone because he thinks that one day he is going to get free out there. It is forbidden love. I will always see him as my great love. And you know what, too? I was also, uh, when we were talking about our last episode, how we were talking about, uh, you know, people. people uh, pen pals, whatever. They love people start- in prison. Yeah. Another reason why, I believe, is that the the girl, the woman, mm-hmm. likes the fact that she always knows where that man is. <laughs> yeah. You're not sleeping with no other girl out there because I know you're in prison. Well, it's a sense of security, right? Like. <laughs> She knows where he is at all times. Or he could be cheating still. Oh, 100%. But with yeah. another dude. But in their minds, they feel like, I know where he is at all times. Oh, God. So they love that fact about them. I'll just put that out there because I, I was kind of a thought about that after the episode. Yeah. I'm like, I do believe that that is one of the reasons as well. You know, I, I kind of agree with that. It's a good point. So anyways, <laughs> where was I? The victim's families were thankfully given an apology from the Chilean government for failing to act more quickly. Although, the people said that it was a cold apology. So that does it for Julio Perez Silva. Still in prison, but hoping to get out and be with his woman. Yeah, because these were only done in like early 2000s. Mm-hmm. So that's only been like 20 years in jail so far. So yeah. And he has 40 years total. Right. So he's got, what, 20 more years he could possibly come out. Yeah, I, do, I just don't see it happening. Like, oh, I wouldn't. Like, holy. Uh, he is the utmost, like, this is sadistic, this guy. It was just one kill after another kill. Yeah, he was like in his berserker stage, just boom, boom, boom. Every month, it was like a couple kills. I just found it weird that his MO never wavered at all. Well, that's a lot of serial killers, though. They like to keep their MOs. If it works for them once, it's going to work for them again and again and again. But and you that's would, what you gets would, them off, too. Yeah, that's true. But when one got away... You would think that he would have changed his MO a little bit? No. Why Why change? Because she could, like, talk. It's, it's what he's used to, too, right? Yeah. So, he's if, lazy? If you wake up every day... Doesn't want to change it? If you wake up every day having eggs and bacon for breakfast, the next day you're going to have eggs and bacon, because it was good. Then the next day, eggs and bacon. No, then you get sick of it. Maybe. Then you want pancakes. I don't want pancakes. I want waffles. <laughs> but people like... A lot of people like that, they want... Especially when you're getting away with it. Like, even though one got away, he still was getting away with it at the time. Like, yeah, the police were closing in and stuff like that, but he wasn't caught yet. No, but she did get away. He had intercourse, so they actually had technology then. Oh, yeah. To 100%. do samples. Yep. But, I mean, he was getting away with it, so you just got to keep doing it. That's a lot of their like, but mindsets. But he, he also didn't even change schools. Like, he didn't go to a different area. He just kept going with the same freaking thing. Like I said... Bacon and eggs. <laughs> Bacon and eggs. <laughs> Every day. Same thing. <sighs> a lot don't waver. Like a lot of serial killers do not waver very much. 
once they find something that they like, they stick to it. Because mm. that's their rituals. They have rituals. Yeah. It's like if when you wake up in the morning, say you like put on your pants, right? You put your leg in, your left leg in first, then your right leg. It's the same for them. No, I just hop in. Both at once. <laughs> <Just> jump? <laughs> yep. Jump off the jump. top of the bed? Yep. <laughs> okay. Ta-da! Do not judge me. <laughs> I have many talents. Ta-da! <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Okay, so if you're still listening, <laughs> okay, yeah. that, that was the case of Julio Perez Silva. Awesome, that was a good little really? case. I was all re- really sorry for the names, like so sorry. Like we tried our best. <sighs> oh, it was I'm, a struggle. It so hard. Some of them are easier. Yeah, but some are pretty hard. Yeah, some of them are just. We do not want to be scared to do these cases because of names. Thank at all you. yeah thank that you is, we want we want these names in the like the cases in the public mm-hmm. and we want people to listen to them because that really did happen like these women mm-hmm. like died and yeah. we need to tell their story and if we can't pronounce their names in places properly we still want to get it out there because you know what you guys can still look it up yeah and read these names yourselves yeah but we're doing our best to say them and if we get more hate we're we're just gonna brush it off and we, keep we going. Always do and keep going because we really don't care about what people have to say if we're saying things wrong because we're doing our best. You know, in the end of the day, we're still telling the story the way it happened, and we might get a couple names wrong or places wrong because we're not enunciating them properly. Well, we're sorry about that, but the story's still getting told. Exactly, and these names are still getting out there. Yep. And- we're still trying to make the victims have a voice. Yeah. We're doing the best we can. And we're just sorry that we can't get it done to like 100%. We're but, Canadian, eh? Yeah, but <laughs> for people saying that, you know, what did they say? It was balls. What did they say it was? I don't know. It sounded like balls or something. I have no idea. And you know what? The funny thing is, it was over an episode that actually had English names. I know. I think it was because it had a lot of views on YouTube. So they just decided to pick that one yeah i don't know it could just been hate to us i don't know it is what it is but we got rid of the comments because they weren't educated by any means oh they definitely were not educated no they were thrown (laughs) in there with a bunch of ball sounding stuff yeah if you're gonna like put us down on the way we say a name from a different country then maybe you should work on your grammar yeah and use bigger words than balls and you suck yeah (laughs) because i mean we're not going to sit there and just, <laughs> no. it was funny to look at, but I'm like, oh. like, it is what it is. Yeah, it's funny. It's like, oh, Brad, I got in trouble. <laughs> well, we're doing the best we can. Like, what, what more can we do? We're not going to shy away from it either. Like, nope. we do know that a lot of people do shy away from this stuff because they see the names. They're like, nope. Yeah. But we told ourselves when we started this podcast, it's called World's True Crime for a Reason. We mm-hmm. want to go around the world. Yeah, absolutely. But we're, I think that's our rant. I think you ranted pretty well. It was a good little rant. It was. I think we needed something like that because, I mean, we do get a little bit of hate for the pronunciation of places, but... But we also get the love, too. We get lots of love from everybody. We get more love than we get hate, we so do. whatever. Brush it off. Yep. So... Give them the, the single finger <laughs> shuffle, right? Yep. The salute. <laughs> the salute. <laughs> okay, so that's probably going to do it for us. If you guys okay. want to contact us and give us some hate about our <laughs> names, we're at World's True Crime. <laughs> do at hot, it <laughs> at hotmail.com yeah worldstruecrime.com is our website i yep. mean we don't really spend a lot of time on there but it's kind of we have it yep we're on instagram facebook twitter youtube all your places and uh yeah we also do have a patreon we don't like to put out to there too much but we're saying that we have one we're not going to uh promote it too much and don't forget uh to check out m cubed murder mystery and mayhem yeah m3 if you want to call them doesn't matter they yep. don't care they're easy going they're great people they're really nice they're really funny too yeah they are and yeah we're gonna put all their stuff in our description so you guys could find them if you haven't found them already because yeah they're a great podcast to listen to yeah even if you go onto our instagram and uh check out who we're following you'll find them there yeah they're always around there they are so i guess that does it that's gonna do it for us so uh Just remember, Denise, Mm. the world's not always as it seems. No, it's not, Brad. Bye, everyone. Bye.